her. We've got a film about a 78-year-old widower. We've got an eight-year-old hyperactive chubby child. With, they're out in the middle of Venezuela with a floating house, talking dog, a 13-foot bird, a psychotic, looked like Colonel Cutts in his, his cave from <laughs> Apocalypse Now. Were you guys high when you put this film together? Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you might think, but no. We, we, we saw, saw all those elements and thought, of course. You know, this is a story we want to tell. We thought it would be fun. We did. We, we just wanted to take the audience somewhere they haven't been, you know. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. Actually, I thought it might be a Disney Pixar Rizla film. I wasn't <laughs> sure what was going on here. <laughs> I know that young Pete Doctor, he had this simple drawing, you know, back, uh, way back five years ago of, of just this old man with a bunch of balloons and the idea that, the, you know, the sort of contrast of this grumpy old man and yeah. balloons kind of struck him as potentially a lot of humor. Was it always an easy sell to, to the money men to say, well, I know that this isn't the regular thing to do, but our guy is going to be 78 years old. He's going to be a widower and he's going to be, he's the guy we're going to follow in his coming of age tale. You know, it's funny. We, we didn't really worry too much about it. I mean, I, I did as producer. I thought, oh, God, where, where are we going to go with this? But when we first had our, our first pitch, I remember with John Lasseter, we did sort of a table read. And before we got to the house going up or all, all these strange elements, we just kind of, Bob Peterson pitched the whole beginning and their life and them as kids and sort of this Frank Capra-esque, you know, small town America and all the way through their life together. And he got John Lasseter crying just at the table read. And, and at that point, John was like, that, that was good, let's make this. Because he felt, and this is what we were after, is like, give it an emotional core. If you give it an emotional core, a reason to make the film, you, you kind of, the sky's the limit in where you can take it. In some ways we wanted to tell like a, it's like create our own fairy tale or a tall tale or something. But we needed a reason, you know, to get there and a reason why Carl would do this. So yeah, I think it was all about that, that kind of gut emotional spine. Well, that, that idea of the sky's the limit, certainly Pixar's last film, Wally, and this film, a lot more Miyazaki than, than Mickey Mouse or even Monsters Inc. This sort of idea that this is one of these studios that people adore and feel that they turn to for those kind of groundbreaking kind of moments of pushing out the envelope, not just in animation obviously, but storytelling itself is, is quite brave. And I don't know whether, you know, when, when this film gets kind of dark and surreal as Wally did, that, there's th that those things are a concern that you're thinking, well, how far do we take a child? Do we go right into the side of the, 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 the stomach of Monstro the Whale and stay there for like 10 minutes or, you know, will they take it? Will they come with us? Yeah, it's funny. You know, we, we, uh, Pete said once that, because uh, we, we thought about that, of course we think about kids, and on one hand, we don't, because we think of these as films and not even animated films. We think of them as films that happen to be animated. But, you know, we, th we all have kids. You know, I have a three-year-old, and, you know, Pete has a great two, two kids, and he, he once said that, well, emotion is the first language you understand. So we thought, well, kids will get it. I know it's, it's high stakes emotionally, but we think kids will understand it and the kids will be okay going with it. We tried to balance it with a certain whimsy and humor. And, uh, and if you look at all the old fairy tales, I mean, they're all very heavy. Oh, I, I grew up watching Bambi. I see it very differently now as an adult than I did when I was a, when I was a child. But nonetheless, it's entertaining and it's wonderful. And we wanted to sort of make a throwback to those films, you know, to the old Disney films of when, you know, before we were even born. I know that, that it's been said that the, the main character, Carl Friedrichson, there's a certain de degree of like uh, Spencer Tracy and Walter Matthau and even some of the old great Disney men like Joe Grant and Ollie yeah. Johnson and all that. But I couldn't help but think that this central story of, of an old cantankerous uh, pensioner and a very young, hyperactive, blabbermouth kid, kind of Demi Moore and Ka Ashton Kutcher as well, maybe in there <laughs> as well. I don't, think there's a kind of <laughs> I don't know. We never thought that. But we, we think there's, a, there's even a stronger bond sometimes between grandparent and, and child and even more so than parent and child and and both of these characters you know as we meet them they're not whole you know they're both kind of missing something Carl's lost something Russell's clearly lost something and it's just kind of fun to watch them kind of complete each other in a way you would never expect that was sort of the joy of it we have with Pixar now this sort of uh, fact that, that as I say the films just get you know more and more interesting and, and, and kind of more left field in, in many ways they are films rather than just big broad entertainment kind of uh, 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 films for kids uh, but that comes with a price, of course, because then the more artistic you get, the, the more that the commerce side of it might sort of be a little bit harder to predict. And, and there's a sense with this one that I know Wall Street was saying that they're not quite sure exactly what sort of they would expect from merchandising and all that. And for you, you're sitting on what some people estimate to be about $175 million worth of a film with all the marketing and everything taken in. I mean, would you sleep well on, on the weekend that it opens? I don't know whether you have this horrible fear that Monday you'll have the cone of shame. Or you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm nervous for all of them. I, I mean, John has always said, you know, quality is our business plan, so we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Um, do I think about it? Yeah, sure, I do. I want people to enjoy it as much as we enjoy making it. But we, we know we can't really control what people say or how Wall Street reacts or how the film's reviewed or the box office, but we do know and we can not control that it's the best we can do every single time. We're going to treat every film like it's the last one we're ever going to do. 
And so, you know, and we, we you know, we're, we're populist and not auteurs. We try to find that balance, but we do want to, we do think of the audience and we do want to create something that they're going to enjoy and love. And for nine films, I think we've done that, even though there's different degrees of that. Uh, we, we hope up is the same and we hope people really do enjoy it.